Hello, I'm Sophie Rodner from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this media briefing from ACS Fall 2021. We're joined today by Dr. Annalise Barron from Stanford University School of Medicine and Dr. Gil Diamond from the University of Louisville. They are developing possible new antivirals against COVID-19 and herpes. Dr. Diamond. Thank you. Uh, antimicrobial peptides are naturally occurring short proteins that are found all over the body and that have potent antimicrobial activity. They can function to prevent infections from all types of pathogens, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses. We can synthesize these peptides and show that not only do they have strong broad spectrum activity, but microbes don't seem to be able to develop resistance against them, suggesting they could make excellent new antibiotics. However, attempts to make drugs out of these peptides has failed for a number of reasons. The primary one is that they can be digested by enzymes that will inactivate them. To address this problem, Dr. Barron's lab has investigated the design of a novel type of molecule that mimics the structure of the antimicrobial peptide, but is resistant to the enzymes that would degrade them. So we can see the structures on the next slide. These structures are called peptoids. And together, we began examining whether these antimicrobial peptoids could be useful as new antimicrobial drugs. Since antiviral drugs are very hard to develop, and for obvious reasons this year, we were in dire need of antivirals, we tested the several peptoid structures against the virus. First virus we tested was herpes simplex virus 1, or HSV1, the virus that causes cold sores. But it can also cause blindness, genital infections, and sometimes it's even fatal. What we see in this slide here is a cryo-electron microscope image of a herpes virus. On the left, you see an untreated virus with an intact membrane around a central core called the capsid. The membrane is called an envelope. After treatment with a peptoid, we see that in some cases, the membrane has been disrupted. You can see that sort of on the bottom right where the membrane was torn apart. Other cases, it's been completely removed and all you see is just the capsid, which makes the virus completely inactive and it can't infect the cell. Our results from these and other experiments clearly showed that the peptoid is antiviral against HSV through a novel mechanism where the virus is attacked and inactivated. When we saw this new type of method of antiviral activity, we thought the peptoids may also work against other viruses that have membranes around them. The most obvious one for us to try next was SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So in the next slide, we can see that these peptoids do exactly the same thing to this virus, and inactivated by disrupting the membrane. The capsid of this virus isn't as pretty as, as herpes and an electromicrograph. We can still, still see how the membrane is destroyed by the peptoid. And uh, in some cases, it's, it's just disrupted. We see some of the membrane. In other cases, we see a completely disrupted membrane and just this, this nucleocapsid is what it's called, what the central part of the, uh, of the virus is. Of course, activity in a laboratory culture dish is good, but to develop these as drugs, we need to see that they work in animal models. We adapted a model of herpes infection in mice by making an abrasion uh, on the lip of a mouse and applying some herpes virus to it. So if you see, go to the next slide, we can see this model. And after we apply the virus, within a few days, we start to see a lesion that looks like a cold sore. So if we apply peptoid and a cream to the lip of the mice two days after the infection, and then take pictures and see how the lesions develop, we can see that in this group of five mice, there's five mice per group. In most cases, the lesion in the treated mice on the bottom row didn't even develop. So on the top row, you can see these lesions, these cold sores that we see in the, in the infected mice. On the bottom row are the treated mice where we applied daily uh, the, the drug in a cream onto the lip where we, we had infection. And for the most part, we don't even see any lesions. They never really developed. This suggests that peptoids can inactivate the virus at the site of the infection and prevent the infection. Now, the big problem with herpes virus is that once it infects the lip, the virus migrates to a nerve called the trigeminal nerve, where it stays dormant long after the cold sore is healed. Then it can come back over and over again. So we took out the trigeminal nerves from these mice after the experiment, and we measured how much herpes virus was in there. And we see a large decrease in the viral DNA in the treated mice. And you can see that in the, in the graph on the bottom right there. Uh, once we looked at that, we, we saw a large decrease in the viral DNA 
And that suggested not only can the peptoid clear the infection, it may also be able to prevent the virus from actually staying in the body, which would then prevent the, the cold sore from coming back over and over again. We're very excited about the potential for these types of molecules to be developed into antiviral drugs, not just for herpes, where it could be used as a cream to, 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 to prevent the infection, either as a prophylactic method, a preventative, or even if you start to feel uh, a cold sore coming on, you could put it on and then prevent the actual cold sore from arriving. But it could also be useful for many other types of viral infections, possibly even for COVID-19. And we're working together with Joshua McClure at Maxwell Biosciences to develop these molecules as antiviral drugs. Thank you. Now I would like to ask you both a few questions about your work. To start with, can you explain what a peptide is? So a peptide is effectively a, a short protein, a string of amino acids. Generally, when we refer to peptides, we talk about molecules that are uh, under 50 amino acids in length, rather than a longer protein, which may have multiple chains of, amino, of, of peptides. But a peptide is a single chain of amino acids. Right, and among peptides, there are a few that are antimicrobial. Can you talk about their role in the body? So uh, the field really began uh, when my, actually my postdoctoral mentor, Mike Zasloff was looking at frogs and he was, at, uh, he needed cells from a frog, he needed actually the oocytes from female frogs and he would make an incision in their skin and remove the oocytes and then sew up the skin and um, then put the frog back in this pond water aquarium he had in the laboratory and noticed that they actually never got infected, even though he never took any uh, aseptic procedures, never put any alcohol or anything like that. And the pond water has was filled with microbes. So uh, if you think about a frog, it's slimy on the outside. And he thought that maybe there's something in the slime that kills the bacteria and the virus and the fungi and actually was able to purify a class of peptides, these linear peptides from the frog skin, which he called meganids. Uh, and that was really one of the beginnings of the, the whole area of research, suggesting that animals and now every species that we can find has some sort of a peptide that kills bacteria, fungi, viruses this natural defense mechanism. Once we started looking in humans and other animals, we found that these were all over the place, especially in mucosal surfaces, like in the lungs, in the mouth, uh, in the, in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, any place where you would have a microbe interface with the body, where we inhale bacteria all the time, we have all sorts of pathogens that come in through our mouths, uh, places like that, as well as in white blood cells, that their job is to go around and gobble up bacteria, fungi, you've got to kill them somehow. This seems to be one of the ways they kill them. So all throughout the body, we have these antimicrobial peptides that their natural function is to prevent infection or take care of any type of early infection. So could we just give humans an extra batch of those as a treatment or prophylactic? Right. So that was the first thing that happened. Once, you know, anybody started working in this field and discovered a brand new antimicrobial peptide, they immediately started a drug company because the cool thing, as I mentioned earlier, was that as let's take bacteria as an example, bacteria rapidly develop resistance to antibiotics. If you don't take your full course of antibiotics, you can develop a, a, a bacteria bacterium that, that, that is resistant to that antibiotic you were taking, and then you won't be able to kill the infection. But it turns out that the way that that these peptides work, which is usually by targeting the membrane of the microbe and destroying it, they can't develop resistance to that. So it makes sense that this would be a really good antibiotic. The problem is whenever anybody tried to develop these as drugs, they, they failed. There are a number of reasons that, that they work great inside our body, but you can't seem to give it for once. Um, now, some research like in my laboratory, for example, is can we uh, look at the genes that encode these things and somehow turn them up so we make more of them? But another way is to, which is what uh, Dr. Barron has looked at, is to look at the design the structure of these peptides, figure out how we can change the structure in such a way to make them more resistant and more deliverable and bioavailable as drugs than the natural ones. And then these could be used as the actual drug. So use the structure of the peptide, the concept, of the peptide and the way it kills the microbe and then 
change the chemistry in such a way that it's it's a better drug and that that's where these peptoids have come in all right and can you give a brief summary of how they differ the peptoids differ from natural peptides uh annalise could you do a, a, a good yes. job of that explaining <laughs> yes actually so um like uh you know in in the in the organic chemical approach to creating peptides the peptides are made um on solid phase you know with small tiny plastic beads and these days we use automated peptide synthesizers so which uh um facilitate the production of say long specific sequences of peptides up to approximately 50 amino acids the peptoids are also made on a peptide synthesizer but by a slightly different stepwise process and the chemical difference between a peptide and a peptoid is that the peptoid has its side chains attached to the backbone nitrogen um, in the uh, peptide backbone. And it's actually a very neat thing because the sequence of atoms in the backbone of a peptoid is in fact identical to that of a peptide. And you can think of the structure as being different in that all the side chains, you know, of course there are 20 different amino acid side chains in a natural peptide. Um, are in fact appended one bond over to the nitrogen rather than to the alpha carbon. So this makes peptoids um, completely invulnerable to protease degradation, which is quite remarkable. Um, if you did want them to break up, you could certainly introduce protease sites in the middle of them. Um, but you know what's also remarkable is that um, we showed, and, and I worked, my postdoctoral advisor, Ron Zuckerman, was the original co-inventor of these peptoids. And when I was a postdoc with him, we showed that we could actually make biomimetic helices, not the same as alpha helices, but polyproline type one helices. We could make complex three-dimensional folded structures with peptoids. Ron has gone on to show that we can chelate metals with them. They are truly biomimetic. They truly mimic peptides. And what is most amazing about what Ron accomplished, Ron Zuckerman, um, and he started at Chiron and then went to the Molecular Foundry at no L Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, is that he worked very hard to make the synthesis of peptoids extremely efficient. So the stepwise efficiency of, of adding peptoid monomers is very, very close to that of optimized peptide synthesis, which makes very long peptoids, up to 50 peptoid monomers in a very specific sequence with potentially you know, you actually can put in a much greater diversity of side chains when you make peptoids than the 20 amino acids, or you can mimic all 20 amino acids. You can do as you like, but they're truly a biomimetic medicine uh, candidate, um, which offers many of the, the, the wonderful features of natural peptides, but, but also offers stability in the body and a highly tailorable synthesis, which is highly efficient. And I would mention, I am not a chemist. I am not an organic chemist. I am a chemical engineer with some expertise in organic and analytical chemistry. And I think it's quite striking that as a chemical engineer, my, you know, I and my students were able to, to do this work, which actually this was a, a project that was started uh, back in 1999. Um, so th this is the culmination of, of decades of work on, on our part, but I really couldn't make reach the, the milestone of um, impacting human health until I found someone like Gil Diamond to work with me. And so what conditions have you tried these compounds on? Uh, so I've tested these pepto peptoids against the DC viruses. We've looked at fungi and bacteria. I know Annalise has collaborated with several other uh, scientists who've looked at other microbes. So, so pretty much we're looking at the, the whole gamut of, of uh, pathogenic microbes. Yes, and I'd like to mention, uh, Sophie, uh, a remarkable aspect of these peptoids is that we, you know, we have shown that they seem to be pretty good mimics of a natural human host defense peptide, which is called LL37, which has the remarkable property itself of being produced by the body on demand very rapidly by many, many different cell types. And LL37 is simultaneously the same peptide in the human body antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and antiparasitic, and anti-cancer, and antibiofilm. This is an incredibly miraculous natural peptide. And our peptoids so far, in we've tested them against 
Oh, so I think 50 different strains of bacteria, including pan-resistant strains of bacteria that resist every FDA-approved antibiotic. They're active there. We, these same peptoids that we're showing you that are antiviral are also antifungal and antibacterial and antiparasitic and safe for human cells. Gil didn't have time to mention that, but you know, an active concentration for these peptoids is very similar to what we see for the natural peptides in the area of 10 to 20 microgram per mil. That may, so may sound a bit high since we're used to drugs being often nanomolar, but they're, they're totally non-toxic to normal human cells. And we've shown this in primary human cells at concentrations well above 256 microgram per mole. So there's a good therapeutic window for these compounds and they truly are biomimetic in their broad spectrum activity. And why do you think they don't harm human cells? Oh, Gil can answer that, that one. Okay, so that goes to that goes to the way that we believe that peptoids and antimicrobial peptides in general kill microbes. Um, as I had mentioned, they target the membrane of the microbe. Now, if we think about a, a microbial membrane or any biological membrane, the biological membranes are phospholipid bilayers, but the head groups on the outside of the, the layer are different. So for a microbe, the head groups, the outside of the, the membrane tends to be anionic. And these peptides and peptoids are cationic. So the first thing that happens is this electrostatic interaction where you get a binding, an attraction and a binding of the peptide or peptoid to the membrane. And then because of its structure, it can actually insert, fold into the membrane and disrupt it. Now, our membranes, host cell membranes, mammalian cell membranes, are not anionic. They're actually either cationic or neutral. So we don't get that interaction. So the peptides or peptoids won't interact with it. Now, this brings up a really good question about the virus, because the biology of how viruses work, as we're learning now, um, we're all becoming virologists, is that a virus that has a membrane on it will fuse with the host cell membrane. The virus will go inside, make a lot of itself, and then acquire membrane and burst out of the cell. Well, that membrane is acquired from the host cell. So you'd say, well, it's a host cell membrane. It's got to be the same as our membrane, so it shouldn't be attacked by the peptide or peptoid. But where it gets its membrane is actually different. And the it turns out that the, the at least the herpes virus envelope has this anionic, this negative charge on the outside that our cell membranes don't. So it there's a differential activity of the of the drug for the virus versus the host cell. All right, and um, going back to herpes simplex virus, can you tell us uh, about the symptoms that that virus causes? So the standard uh, disease that HSV-1 causes over throughout history has generally been uh, an oral lesion, usually on the lips, sometimes on the inside of the mouth, what we generally refer to as a cold sore. There's also um, uh, an infection in the eye that HSV-1 can cause. Those are the primary illnesses caused by HSV-1 throughout history. And as I mentioned, it gets and hangs out in this trigeminal nerve and can be there. So if you tend to get cold sores, you won't have one for a while. Something can happen, possibly stress, that will reactivate the virus and it will go back out and cause that uh, cold sore again. Now, increasingly in recent history, there's another uh, a species of herpes simplex virus, HSV2, which, is, which has um, in general been associated with genital herpes lesions. Uh, we're seeing almost a switch where HSV1 is now also causing um, genital herpes as well. So we're seeing HSV1 causing both oral lesions, ocular lesions, genital lesions, uh, and we're also seeing HSV2 causing oral lesions. And we'll be testing this against HSV2 as well. So that could possibly be used as a, a drug to treat those types of uh, those types of infections as well. And Dr. Barron, there are other um, diseases associated with, with- Indeed, you know, we, we do understand that both um, <clears throat> herpes simplex virus one and SARS-CoV-2 um, you know, when they cause infections in the body, they can cause neurological symptoms because, of course, as Gil has mentioned, HSV1 is able to invade neurons and go into the trigeminal nerve, but uh, and SARS-CoV-2 can also invade neurons. And in fact, um, 
in recent work, and, and in fact, it really goes back 25 years, but was really validated in recent work. It's been shown that herpes simplex virus one is able to get into the brain um, of a person who has a chronic infection with HSV1, which is, by the way, around 70% of adults in America. So the number of people that who are, are infected with chronic HSV1, whether or not it is symptomatic, it's about 177 million American adults. So this is a very large population that's infected. And now chronic HSV-1 infection has been associated with the development of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. The thing that's really quite interesting about it, however, is uh, something like 96% of people who died with Alzheimer's disease have brain tissue that's infected with herpes simplex virus 1. But about 84% of people who died without dementia also have HSV-1 in their brain. So it seems like um, there's some aspect of human immunity in the brain that causes some people to manifest memory loss and, and, and those common symptoms of Alzheimer's and others not. And that may in fact be related to the person's uh, nutritional and lifestyle factors um, that, that affect their expression of one of the most uh, potent natural peptides against HSV-1, which is in fact LL37, uh, which our peptoids mimic. But um, you know, our goal therefore is possibly to create this as a prevention for the development of, of dementia in, in older age by hopefully prophylactically uh, preventing people from contracting HSV-1 infection and also providing an, um, a way for them to upregulate their LL37 naturally. I believe this will be a synergistic approach to preventing dementia in older age that will be available to, uh, to people soon, if all goes well. All right. And are your peptoids made of a single type of molecule or a mixture of different structures? Oh, that is a very good question. You know, um, the, originally when we designed our peptoids as mimics of antimicrobial peptides, we were mimicking the original antimicrobial peptide meganin that was discovered by Gil Diamond's postdoc advisor, Michael Zasloff, wonderful guy. Um, and then we realized, in fact, that it was perhaps a better mimic of LL37, which is composed of 37 amino acids. Now, whereas LL37 and meganin are made of many, many different types of amino acids, we have made these peptoids out of only uh, four or five different peptoid monomers. So um, our most potent compounds have a terminal alkyl chain, uh, which mimics um, uh, other types of antimicrobial peptides. And then they contain cationic side chains that are mimics of lysine, which we call N-lyse because they're attached to nitrogen. And then they have uh, aromatic side chains, which are mimics of phenylalanine, which we call NS-phenylethyl side chains. And those are actually chiral side chains. And I'll just mention that the inclusion of chiral side chains in peptoids allows them to form chiral structures, which is also mim mimetic of natural polypeptides, which always form chiral structures. So would one type of peptoid treat multiple types of disease, or would you tailor the peptoid to each condition? How would you handle that? Yes, I would say, um, you know, so far we've been working in recent years with a small library of about 20 different peptoids, among which we discovered uh, five different active compounds and selected three different active compounds for the fact that they were also extremely selective for killing pathogens. And among those three compounds, they have slightly different profiles in their ability to kill you know, viruses versus fungi versus bacteria versus parasites, but they all have, um, you know, so, so they may be more active against a certain strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Candida auris or, or uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, but, um, you know, it's really extraordinary the extent to which they do have that, uh, you know, ability of like natural host defense peptides to not only you know, be active against a wide range of pathogens while still being safe for most types of human cells, uh, but also you know, the fact that um, they, they don't appear 
to allow the development of resistance, at least in bacteria. And Gill did an experiment with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and tested two of our different peptoid leads and showed that there was no development of resistance in 30 passages. Um, you know, if we had the peptoid present at a non-lethal concentration, you know, we, we didn't see the pathogen developing resistance. So that's extremely exciting because antimicrobial resistance is really an enormous problem. Because the peptoids are so stable, unlike natural peptides, could they persist longer in the body or in the environment than we want them to? That is a great question. Um, so these are relatively small molecules. Um, the molecular weight is between 835 and 1200 grams per mole at the largest among our lead compounds. What we have learned, and this will be presented uh, later, is that you know they really need that, that 10 to 20 microgram per mil concentration to be active. And therefore, um, as they pass out of the body, which so far we've seen will occur within 24 hours, we've done some preliminary uh, pharmacokinetic uh, studies and we dosed the peptoids, one particular peptoid, we dosed at um, per oral, intravenous, and intraperitoneal. And we saw it passing out of the body without harming the animal uh, within 24 hours. That was actually published in 2011. Um, and then we believe that as it passes out of the body, because it will be diluted hugely, right, in urine or feces, um, it really won't have any biological activity once it reaches the environment. And I want to mention one other thing, Sophie, that's important. You know, because the peptoids are not degraded by proteases, we can give much, much smaller doses, you know, like milligram per kilogram body weight than we would need to give for a peptide, which typically has a half-life of about nine minutes in the body, in the human body. Whereas the half-life of the peptoids is, you know, in terms of proteolytic degradation, you know, infinite. It does not get degraded by proteases. Do you have a sense of when a peptoid treatment might go to clinical trials? Yes. You know, um, the, the startup company that I co-founded with Joshua McClure um, called Maxwell Biosciences is just finishing um, another round of funding, and we are actively planning clinical trials now. And we're just trying to decide exactly which indication would be best to start with for fast-track FDA approval. We haven't made that decision yet. Uh, but we hope very soon, we hope, you know, definitely that clinical trials will be starting in 2022. All right. And how about the cost of these treatments? How might it compare to other treatments? Um, I would say in general, you know, peptide drugs tend to be substantially more expensive to use than, than small molecule drugs. And I would give an example. There's now, I think, 65 peptide drugs that have been approved. And I think, you know, Whereas often uh, a small molecule drug may be in the hundreds of dollars per year, um, a peptide drug would be in the thousands of dollars per year. Peptoids should cost approximately 25 to 33 percent as much as a peptide drug, because in fact the the the, the reagents that are used for the stepwise solid phase synthesis of peptoids are substantially less expensive than those used to create peptides. However, both peptoids and peptides must be purified by high-performance liquid chromatography, which is inherently an expensive purification process. So to conclude, what do you want viewers to take away from your talk? What's the key conclusion or a message? Gil, and how about you then me? Okay. Uh, I think uh, one key conclusion is that these peptoids are uh, excellent platforms to develop new drugs to treat uh, multiple types of microbial infections, especially viral infections at a time when we are desperate to get antiviral drugs on the market. And I think these uh, are a great safe alternative and uh, um, can be useful to develop many different types of drugs. Elise? Yeah, and I wanted to say, you know, this is really a, a really neat thing about Maxwell Biosciences is that um, pretty much all of the scientists um, who are working on peptoids that I have interacted with are part of this. So this is really, you know, Joshua McClure, who is a um, 
actually a military veteran is the CEO, but there are multiple uh, professors involved in this company. Ronald Zuckerman, who, who created the peptoids initially with his coworkers, myself, Kent Kirschenbaum, with whom I was postdoc and initially studied the peptoids, and Bob, Robert Hancock, who's a real leader in the area of antimicrobial peptide drugs. Um, I'm forgetting uh, many people. So there's at least like seven or eight professors that are working on this because we're all so excited about the possibility of mimicking, you know, these amazing natural antibiotics that our body uses quite effectively, generally, to prevent infections, right? Antimicrobial peptides are underappreciated because they mostly prevent infections, right? So here we can make an absolutely new class of drugs that is broad spectrum, you know, oh, and I want to mention 94% of COVID patients in the ICU have a co-infection with bacterial pathogens in their lungs as well. So the fact that the peptoids mimic antimicrobial peptides and are simultaneously active against SARS-CoV-2 and against bacterial pathogens could be very important for saving people's lives. Thank you. Media briefings for ACS Fall 2021 will be posted throughout the meeting at www.acs.org slash ACS Fall 2021 briefings.